Say hello, everybody. <laughs> hello. Welcome to Cheltenham Festival, everyone. Welcome to the coolest venue at Cheltenham Festival, yes. the Voice Box. Of course, yeah. dressed to impress, of course. I'm Max Whittle. I'm a sports presenter, and I'm sure like all of you here, have a massive interest in mental health, which is why I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Sophie Moore, who's a clinical psychologist now taking psychology out of the therapy room with her new book, A Manual for Being Human. It's fantastic. Thanks. You've had a wild weekend. You've been jumping around with your book, I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my mum is here, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yes, mum. <laughs> and um, in, in a rather probably embarrassing style, we like to go into bookshops to see if my book is in there. <laughs> But we adopt a disappointed stance before entering every bookshop, assuming it won't be there. So when it is, we get very excited. So there's lots of picture, pictures of us in different bookshops with my book. So, yeah. I don't have a book yet, but mum, we're doing that soon. Okay, that's, that's I hear there's plenty over here waiting to be bought, <laughs> so you'll be fine. <laughs> I think the number one reason I'm happy to be in your company is because I found out when you finished the book... You had a beer in the bath. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that must have been a wild time. <laughs> it, well, in the pandemic, that probably is as wild as it got. <laughs> um, it was locked down. I finished the book pretty much in the middle of the night, maybe at one o'clock in the morning. And it had been really nearly finished since about 6 p.m. I don't know anyone here has ever handed in a big piece of work, but it does take about six, seven hours to hit send. So when I finally did, I was shaking and I was so excited and really the only place in my house that isn't just that one room is the bathroom so I took a beer to the bath and it was yeah really good. good what's the big difference between this book and others in the space that is a great question I think um whenever you want to understand something about yourself anything you want to understand about yourself right now there really is access that we didn't used to have you can go on Instagram, you can find a book on the inner critic, relationships, your attachment styles, pretty much everything. But pre a manual for being human, hmm. I sorry, I still cringe when I big myself up. <laughs> um, pre a manual for being human, no one had written something that could provide a framework, something that you could under, use it to underpin all of this other information you have. So I wanted to start with something that started with your first breath taking you all the way through to wherever you are in life right now, so that then, once you had a thorough grounding in who you are, what makes you tick, what makes you struggle, and how to cope, you could then go to, the, go to those other books and pick and choose what you needed, a bit like um, choose your own adventure. Mm. <laughs> so this is almost like, you know in a wardrobe where you hang all your clothes? This is the wardrobe, and then the other books are the little suits and skirts and whatever you choose to wear on top. Just to make sense of it, could you give us an example of how we repeat the patterns that we did adopt when we were younger? Oh, big question. Yes, big good question. one. I'm mean, starting early on. Okay. Only got half so hour. essentially, babies come into the world, I think this is really cool, when their brains are about, about a third of their full development, which means that your brain developed in the world. So yes, you have DNA that predisposes you in many ways. So for example, how short your fuse is, how likely you are to be um, distractible. But much like the way a building is adapted to its terrain, you have your DNA, but you developed to adapt to your own personal surroundings. So say you came into the world and you had a really calm, loving environment. Mum, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> then your brain can, if you're lucky enough to have that, learn the world is safe. I can relax. If, however, this is one of many examples, you come into the world and it's not safe, it's chaotic, it's dangerous, your brain is incredibly smart, switches you into this kind of constant hyper alert, looking for danger in your environment so that it can keep you safe before something goes wrong. You're going to survive something if you've already preempted it, much more than if you wait until something bad has happened and respond then. So just as one example, for someone who grew up in a chaotic environment, their brain adapts really smartly to keep them safe. But it does mean that later on, they are more likely to be more anxious, often, because their brain is set to high alert. There are other things, such as those earliest caregivers. They're your blueprints for your relationship. So, for example, if that person is able to see, act almost like, um, you know, um, mother birds? 
You know how they, quite revoltingly, get a worm and then they chew it up and they regurgitate it into their baby's mouths? That's what we need our caregivers to do. We need them to see our emotional state on the inside, that we're just kicking and screaming, we have no idea what we're feeling. And they take that emotion, like chew it up and feed it back in a way that makes sense to us. So you're screaming. It makes sense, it's because you're cold. When you're cold, I wrap you in a blanket. So it gives you this really um, solid understanding of your emotions that then later on when you feel something, you go, oh, my emotions, I can make sense of them, I know what to do. And also, if you have that kind of caregiver, you again grow up thinking, people will be there for me. So the patterns that you have in your adult life from childhood are everywhere. And I'm not going to pour an ocean into your cup and explain them all, but those are some kind of key examples. You also talk about predictions in the book and how yeah. we don't live our lives based on the world around us. We, we predict it. Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So you're not listening to us right now in the way that you might think you are. You are not waiting to hear what I'm saying. Your brain is way... Sorry, it's so weird because most people are over here, so I'm sitting kind of <laughs> at this angle. Um, your brain is way ahead of us, and it's actually finishing our sentences. And it's only if suddenly we started talking about, I don't know... I was going to say something really inappropriate just then. <laughs> Imagine I just said something really inappropriate. If I said something like that, there'd be shock. That is because your brain is ahead of you, predicting what's going to happen next. Then when the thing does happen that you expect, all you feel is, hmm, didn't even notice anything. If what you predict to happen next, such as, oh, let's imagine someone just skydived through the top of this. Shock. There's a mismatch between what you expect to happen, what happened, surprise comes in. So again, thinking, I see where you're going. Thinking about childhood oh, patterns, yeah, but seeing where, uh, thinking about childhood patterns, it means that everything you experience in life, your brain is making predictions based on what's happened to you in the past. So let's say you were bullied as a kid. You could walk past a group of people who are laughing. If you weren't bullied, you just see a group of people who are laughing. But if you were, your brain might be predicting, running through its memory stores, what happens when kids laugh. Oh my word, they're normally laughing at me. The prediction happens below your level of awareness. A simulation plays out, again, you can't see it. But suddenly your heart is racing. You feel like they're laughing at you and you're responding to a situation that you have predicted, not that is happening in the world right now. Sometimes you're right. That's another conversation for another day. But can you, can you predict my next question? <laughs> oh, I actually don't. Is it about my nana? It's not yet. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. It's a good one, though. Um, I only met you yesterday, and I'm already revealing a secret from the book. So you said, until very recently, I didn't believe any of the stuff about our childhood affecting our here and now. I also didn't see the point in talking about it. Look where we are now. Oh, I know. So what changed? Um, okay, it's a really interesting question. So... <sighs> I think that actually, so firstly, if you haven't read A Manual for Being Human, it's not all about your childhood. It just starts off there because it's one of the earliest building blocks of who we are. But it also talks about the here and now. When I started studying psychology, two reasons. Okay, so firstly, the reason I started studying psychology is because I had panic attacks at the age of 18. They came out of nowhere. The first time I went to see a therapist, the first question they asked me was, so... How's your relationship with your father? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> I'm having a panic attack and you want to go there? Um, and so, needless to say, I left that session and had the worst panic attack of my life. Um, and then eventually I got the right kind of therapy, which helped me understand what anxiety is and how to manage it in the here and now. And the panic attacks started to subside. So the first reason I didn't want to go there when it came to thinking about our psychology related to our childhood is because I'd had a personal experience that was very detrimental. The second reason is because it's actually extremely hard. I'm trying to choose the right word. It's extremely painful to sit with someone and ask them about their childhood and remain present. The job of a therapist is to act essentially is a container, a vessel. Whatever you say to me, I can hold it. I will not collapse. I will not look away. I will be here with you through this whole experience. So if I'm totally honest, 
It was convenient, really, for me to be like, that kind of therapy is terrible. We don't have to talk about that hard stuff. Let's just talk about the panic in the here and now. So, what changed? I think many things, doing my full doctorate and really starting to work with people and see how it can actually change your life if you're able to say, no wonder I struggle in relationships because of X and Y. It's not my fault. Now I can take action, I can take responsibility and change my life going forwards. So I saw the lived experience of it. And I allowed myself to go to proper therapy and find out that it can actually be incredibly useful to face your old demons. So now I really do believe it is not only okay, but it can be important to revisit those pastimes for some people. I love how at the end of every section you write us a little letter, actually. You just check <laughs> in with everyone. Um, you also have these questions, questions for you. Mm. And the one that really got me, and I think we'll get everyone in here, then they'll probably just say yes. Do you think you created a version of yourself that made you more acceptable to others? And I read that and I thought, oh gosh, every day. Um, <laughs> why do we care what other people think um, about us? Well, because it's how we survived as a species. If I turn my back to you, is it rude or is it okay? <laughs> okay, so if you think about humans, if humans lived as independently as we like to believe we can now, they simply wouldn't have survived. They needed each other to fight for resources, to protect the resources, to fight against danger, to procreate, and also socialize, to learn skills. So for any of our ancestors that did anything that, for example, got them kicked out of the group, it might have spelt instant death. So what's the best way to stay within a group? It's to care what other people think about you. And it's interesting because on Instagram right now, you're going to see a lot of posts that's like, who cares what other people think? You do you. And I agree, that would be lovely if we could exist in that world where we genuinely didn't care. But your brain is scanning the environment four times per second to look for change and to look for potential danger. Danger in this case is social rejection. So to manage that stressful, has anyone experienced FOMO? Have you seen a picture of your friends or people maybe you don't even know, celebrities, having fun, you're like, oh, I'm so hurt they didn't invite me. <laughs> yes, that's because of this ancient drive to fit in. So because of that, we will do anything from an early age to change ourselves, sometimes just morph ourselves a little bit, to change our entire appearance and who we come across who we come across as, just so we fit in. What's your weakness on the gram? Oh, I've got loads of them. <laughs> um, okay, what's my weakness on the gram? As in, what do I look at the most? Or Instagram to the over 50. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm joking. <laughs> what's my weakness? The fact that I know, compar I know how comparison works. Yeah. I know how it works. I know how to use it to make your life better. And I know what will make your life worse. Yet still... If I'm going through a stressful period, I will find myself just doom scrolling, comparing myself to the people who I think, wow, look at their lives. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? So, yeah, my weakness is doing the very thing that I tell others, maybe don't do that. And what about the approval of friends? Is there something you've done in the past that you, you never would have done if it weren't for the approval of friends? Y oh, yes, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> like, I've made very poor life decisions in order to <laughs> impress friends. Uh, it's something you touch on in the book about how we, yeah. our friend circle is so important to how we behave. I mean, you know that I, if you've read the book, you know about my shoplifting period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> we can't give too much away. I want to buy the book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, so definitely, I don't know who here has ever had a first cigarette, but it's actually revolting, your first cigarette. Like, I was 11, and also, if you've seen an 11-year-old now, you're like, I can't believe I had a cigarette at that age. But yeah, I had this first cigarette and I was looking around, it's so cliche, but everyone's like, you good? I was like, <coughs> delicious. Um, and developed a habit very young. So yes, I've done many things. And do you know what though, I'm gonna say, actually, it is kind of important, I think, that we um, still do adapt who we are around certain people. And what I mean by that is, 
there are going to be people that you love and you care about. And when they're around, you're not going to be the same person you were when you were around someone else that you love and you care about. And that is fine. We create closer relationships by shifting just a little bit to be a little bit more like that person we care about. As long as you're not going against your values, hurting people, or pretending to be someone you're not in order to gain approval, actually, there's nothing wrong with that. Our inner critic. Oh, yeah, go on. You talk a lot about that. Uh, why do we develop it and how do we understand it? Okay, so essentially, and this I think uh, is the thread that comes through this book, is being human is incredible. There is almost nothing that we do without reason. So for example, the inner critic, that negative self, self-talk, does everyone here have one? Personal heckler who just gets under your skin insulting you, yeah. <laughs> The reason we have one, even though it seems like, why would it be useful, is because at a very young age, your brain, again, trying to fit in, finds out what the good kid looks like, the most acceptable version of you. It finds out what rules that child would follow. It internalizes them, and then any time you go and act outside of good kid, it tells you not to do it. But, and this is the thing, Children aren't going to respond to a little voice of, hey, so mum said don't eat that biscuit. No kid's going to go, oh, okay, I won't eat it. Or like, again, like mum said, like, don't pull on the dog's ears. And you're like, okay, kids don't think like that. So that inner critic that is meant to try and keep you safe and like, loved by, the, by your caregivers and your family instead essentially attacks you. It shames you because this is the fastest way to change your behavior. And this is really important because if you think, for example, around the way that uh, people are socialized, it'll be different in every family, but a really really common one is little boys, for example, people who are socialized as boys often are told emotions aren't for you. You must never ask for help. You must always know what you're doing. So their inner critic, for example, When a little boy, for example, grows into a a man, when tears come up, when emotions come up, we might hypothesize that the inner critic shouts, no, what's wrong with you, baby? Crying's just for girls. Or, for example, we might hypothesize that when a woman who he's been socialized to believe is, you know, he's meant to know the answers, she's not. When a woman puts forward an argument, the inner critic might step in and be like, real man wouldn't let her say that. (laughs) The reason I'm telling you this is because this is a really good example of how the inner critic supports what we now call toxic masculinity, for example. And once we start really understanding the origins of all of our experiences, such as the inner critic, we can start understanding ourselves, start knowing how to manage the painful moments, but also why other people think and behave the way they do too. Could you say in the book, teaching we're teaching men not to talk and yeah. it's killing them? Yes. That's pretty... That's a pretty strong sentence. Well, we know that um, suicide rates are significantly higher for men. And there's been a... It's not... By the way, just so you know, it's not that me that came up with the idea that we're socialising men not to talk. It's a very very well-talked-about subject. Because often the socialise... Sorry. (laughs) Socialisation of women is problematic also. But when women are struggling, they might be diminished in another way. Oh, women, they're so emotional. Don't listen to her. She's probably on her period. So there is a problem there. But at the same time, people socialize as women may be more likely to share with a friend. I'm struggling with my anxiety. They may be more likely to be taken seriously by their doctor if they say they're struggling with their anxiety. Whereas someone socialized as a man may firstly have the inner critic undermining their ability to speak up about what they're feeling, then have structures around them that don't support them to be able to talk about how they're feeling. And so often they don't get any help until they're really at their limit, when they feel like they don't have any other options. So yes, anyone who here has, you know, who is bringing up boys, for example, socializing someone as a little boy, or any gender, it doesn't matter who they are. What's really important is we tell people they're allowed to feel. There's a reason we have emotions. You could just buy them my book, to be honest. <laughs> just give them the book. Um, tell them what to do when they're struggling. Um, show them that you don't always have the answer. There's something really important because there's. I really want to talk about this fact that 
There's so much pressure on caregivers these days to do the perfect job, and you just can't, right? You're just going to get it wrong from time to time. And actually, the biggest gift you can give your child is, by, is making a mistake and saying, wow, you know, I didn't really know how to handle that thing, but it's okay, because I'm going to figure it out. Or I'm really sorry, I got really cross just then, it's because of X and Y, but normally I meditate. I don't know who that parent is. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, yes, take the pressure off yourself. Is there anyone's listening saying, God, Sophie's telling me that I've got to go and socialize my kids in a certain way? It's okay to get it wrong. We're all learning together. And yeah, it's okay to cry no matter how you identify. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. And there are lots of changes we can make. You, the third section of the book is all about tips. You talk about grounding, breathing exercises. Yes. Self-compassion, or as Sophie likes to call it, how not to be a dick to yourself. That's what. That's actually what. Um, so why do we why do we offer that up to other people? Self-compassion, yes. but not ourselves. Because a lot of us believe it's not for us, and there's there's reasons for that that aren't ups so upsetting, and there's reasons for that that are really upsetting. So, for example, on the really upsetting end, some people have never been shown compassion. Some people have been instead shown hate, harm. So actually for them, the idea of being compassionate to themselves, if that's you, if that's me, we then, when compassion comes up, it feels extremely dangerous. But that's maybe a small percentage of the population. The rest of us just believe, oh, kindness is for other people. If I start being kind to myself, I'll start falling into this kind of sugary, sweet mess. And I think a lot of us as well believe that growth is only possible if we beat ourselves in the right direction. Does anyone else here feel like that? Yeah? How about, does anyone here think if you're kind to yourself, you'll stagnate, you won't be able to make change in your life? Yeah. Right. So if you had your friend here and she was really struggling and she was like, oh, I'm having a really hard time, you're like, listen, bitch, get to it. <laughs> Sorry, I, d I don't, you know. But the reality is a lot of our inner critic is m much harsher than that, if we're honest, right? You, she wouldn't then go, oh, no, you're totally right. I'll go and do that thing immediately, right? When you're, when you're struggling, so it doesn't matter what you're struggling with, if you're having any kind of distressing emotion, you are essentially in the fight or flight response, right? Fight, flight, freeze, fall, and it's more complicated, but your body is preparing you for danger. Now when you criticize yourself, it's like taking a hammer to a broken leg or rubbing salt into an open wound. You go further into the distress response. You don't feel better and you don't feel more motivated. So I dare you all to challenge yourself just a little bit the next time you think, oh, but if I'm kind to myself, I'm going to stagnate. Think about if you had a boss and they shouted at you, would it make you a better worker or a more anxious worker? And then ask what you'd say to your friend if they were in your situation. Ask what you'd do for your friend and say and do those things for yourself. Flip on the cup of tea, maybe, I don't know, if you feel weird giving yourself a little cuddle, and uh, maybe journal, do something nice. Rage journal. Oh, you love a bit of rage. Big journal, fan, babe. Yeah, big yeah. Fan, babe. Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing you can read about. Um, <laughs> you talk about relationships too, and we are at Voicebox. We have to mention dating. Um, yes. First of all, there's no rush, everyone, because Sophie's nana was in her 80s when she met her last boyfriend at the cheese counter in Tesco. Yes, in so. Tesco, like classy lady <laughs> reaching for the cheese. My idea of good first date, to be I honest. I think so, too. Yeah. I have to say that she was uh, pretty spectacular. She was a jazz singer. She was bleaching her hair and piling it up on top of her head, always in, like, great uh, dangly earrings and some fabulous outfit right until the day that she died. Um, but, yes, she was a great lesson, because I think, ag again, we all carry around these timelines a lot, often we don't even know that we have them until we reach a point in our life where we think, I'm not married yet. I don't have that job yet. I don't have a house yet. I don't have, insert thing that's meant to be impressive at the age that you're at here. Mm. And often these timelines, firstly, are often quite sexist and ageist, right? Think about women, for example, who are called, uh, we say that they're mutton dressed as lamb. Think about women being on the shelf, for example. So often the ideas are sexist and ageist, but they're also often wrong, right? My nana met her partner in her 80s, and it's so cool. <laughs> um, 
And not only are they also often wrong, they imply this idea that we have more control in our lives than sometimes we do. So say, for example, you don't have the job. Well, actually, a lot of people coming out of the pandemic have found out there aren't certain jobs available. That is not their failing. That is where we are in the world right now. Often, for example, well, when it comes to dating, there's usually two or three or more people in that relationship, right? So let's say, uh, I was going to say, let's be, don't worry, I'm not going to take him. But let's say we <laughs> She's met in love with you, by the way, not me. I so. love you too, it's fantastic. <laughs> but let's say we went on a date. I'm only responsible for 50% of what's happening here. I cannot control the outcome. Whereas when we have these internalized timelines, we, they're initially an incentive, they're a carrot, but they quickly turn into a stick with which we beat ourselves. Mm. Well, you said, didn't you, when do we go from asking them questions, finding out more about them, to actually, what can I do for them to like me? Yes. It's quite a quick switch. Yes. Okay, again, hands up. Who here has been on a date, and around date three, well, whatever point, you suddenly realise you're kind of into whoever the person is, and it suddenly switches to, what do they think about me? Right? And then you stop trying to figure out who they are, right? You just the whole time, like, I wonder if they'd like that thing about me. I wonder, how shall I dress? Is this a good position? <laughs> I saw someone drinking wine the other day like this. Oh, no. I was like, that is a good position. So anyone who's going on a future date, you drink wine like this. Um, yes. When dating, what is absolutely fascinating is that we lose sight of getting to know the other person. Mm. And we start projecting into the future. We take the very little information we know about the person in front of us. We do this with friends as well and colleagues. And we create an image of that person. And we start dating that image. And often then, they let us down. Because mm. no one is the person in our dreams. Or we start thinking that they're less than because the person in our mind isn't enough. So anyone here dating, keep thinking. Who are you? What do I actually know about you rather than what do I think I know about you? Fact check. Try not to get carried away. Fact check. And the other question to ask on a date, uh, if you ask Sophie, is this desire or is it just an activated attachment system? That's, uh, that's sexy, isn't it? It's like the most psychology comment I've ever heard. Oh, I know. Forget do you want dessert. We're, we're going with that one. Yeah. But... You tell me, is it, when, does it, when is it an activated attachment system? What okay, is, so... Uh, we're still on our date here, so come I on. know, I'm such an idiot. I should have written such a silly sentence. Anyway, <laughs> so do you remember I said any time you're distressed, essentially your fight or flight is activated. So any time you're connecting with someone, if for some reason it makes you feel anxious or uncomfortable, it's the same system that is activating. Now... You could meet someone and be thrilled about them. But maybe, for example, you're not exactly sure whether they like you. And this causes you understandable anxiety. When your fight or flight system is activated, it kind of feels exciting, doesn't it? You're like, will they like me back? Right? What's going to happen next? And we often confuse. I mean, that sentence is really, is it lust or is it just anxiety? Because what happens then is we meet someone who actually we have a great time with, but for some reason they don't trigger our anxiety. They don't make us feel uncomfortable. And we think, well, oh, chemistry wasn't there. <laughs> and we don't give people who actually, if we got to know them, we don't, often don't give them enough chance. We get rid of them because we feel comfortable. When actually relationships are often built on work, not just this, oh, take my clothes off right now. <laughs> Although that's also fun. <laughs> you leave some lovely quotes in the book as well. This is my favorite one. When you're not their cup of tea, do not reinvent yourself as their cup of coffee. Stay true, stay you. That was nice. Oh, I did not write oh, those I words. know, damn it. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I, I could have just can't. not told any of you. Like, wow, she's <laughs> such a poet. Uh, that <laughs> is by an unbelievable poet called Veen Ema Torto. And she is extraordinary because... I think being able to write poetry is such a gift because you can capture real life experiences so succinctly in an analogy where you're just like, oh, I've made myself coffee for so many people, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, I already know that what will happen after this talk is because the more I talk, the more confident I become about being myself. I already know that when I leave this talk and when the adrenaline drops, 
I'm going to start picking myself apart, right? I'll start thinking, oh, no, did I really say that? Did I just say take my clothes off on a stage? <laughs> and that's because even when we move to a period in our lives where we no longer make ourselves into a cup of coffee someone, when we stick, when we stay true, when we are the cup of tea that we really are, there's still this echo of that early conditioning. So going back to your comment about patterns, if you grew up constantly evaluating who you are, worrying about how you came across in order to fit in, even when you grow out of it or you find a way through it, you still have that remnant of it, that flavor. So that's not to say we're all screwed, there's no point in making changes, not at all. It's the fact that if you do notice yourself reaching a point where you're like, yes, I'm so good as I am, it's okay if then afterwards you go, but what if I'm not? <laughs> you don't have to believe that thought and think, oh my word, I've not made any progress in my life. You use mindfulness, you notice it, and you say, okay, I hear you thought. I think I'm okay. You do a breathing exercise, you do something nice for yourself, and you carry on with the next present moment. Before we wrap, I know you wanted to share some tips that you have written about. Um, we probably can't do the dunk, <laughs> dunk your head into ice cold water or... Uh, no one wants to do that? No. <laughs> Singing your inner critic along with your favourite song, that's a good one. But is there anything you'd like to share with everyone here while we've got them? I know what you want me to do. I don't know. You mentioned star jumps or something like that last week. Okay. So, so um, is everyone up for doing something with me? Yes. 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 I love that you said yes before I even say what it is. It could be something terrible. You've already given it away. Okay. Basically, um, anyone who knows, who's ever heard me talk about emotions or has read my book or knows anything about emotions knows that all of our emotional experiences are actually physical sensations in our body. But most of us are using our bodies just to walk our brains around. Have you noticed that? We just use it, our to-do list, we then take it to another part of the house. Yeah. So we're rarely in our bodies. And the way we can change our emotions is by moving our bodies. So I wanted to give you an example of it. So I'm afraid this is no opt-out unless you physically have to. <laughs> yes? Okay, everyone stand up. E. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, the golden retriever's up too. Yeah, the dogs, the dogs are getting involved. Yes, amazing. Ah. Okay, so we're going to do 10 star jumps. If anyone here is American, I know they're called jumping jacks. That's uh, jacks. very multicultural. So I'm going to count. Okay, is it, we might come through this. Okay, I'm going to count. We're going to do it all at the same time. Okay, you ready? So... One, One, two, three, three four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. Ooh. Yeah. The dog loves it. Yeah. Okay, sit down. And I know we, we run out of time, but I just want to just have a check. Oh. How do people feel now? But different. Yeah. Does anyone feel kind of more energized, like kind of almost shaky or like you've got bees in your blood? Yeah? So when we move like that, our adrenaline passes through our body. If you're stressed, this is going to sound wild, but if you're stressed, so before a talk like this, lock yourself into a bathroom and do jumping jacks. If you're on the verge of a panic attack, go for a run. The fight or flight response saved us by making us run from tigers, fight against our threats. When we've finished and we've survived, our brain goes, we can turn it off. We've completed the loop. So those jumping jacks won't just make you excited if you need more energy. They will also help calm your nervous system when you feel overwhelmed. Well, Sophie, thank you for multiple reasons. For the book, the fact that I've just seen my parents do Stardust. I loved it so Never much. Never would have seen that before. Everyone, Sophie Mort, she's fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Well done. High five. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And also, I felt so powerful just then. So thank you for doing that with me. Okay. Um, there's obviously, I will, if you would like to buy a book, you don't have to. I will sign it for you. I don't know if that puts you off rather than lures you in. But, I mean, my mum could sign it for you if you'd rather her she did it. And maybe the lovely dog could do a paw print. But thank you so much for coming. Have a lovely uh, weekend. <laughs>